Good evening. On behalf of the Friends of the Wichita Art Museum, I would like to welcome all of you and thank you for attending this Howard Wooden Lecture. It's very exciting for us to see such a full audience of enthusiastic people. For our speaker, Patricia Junker. I'd like to give you just a little bit of information, a background on the lecture series. All of our Howard Wooden lectures are made possible by the members of the Friends of the Art Mu Wichita Art Museum group. Uh, this is, they have established an endowment fund and it all started back in 1985 when the Wichita Art Museum director, Howard Wooden, <coughs> suggested to the Friends group that an endowment fund could be developed as part of the museum's 50th anniversary celebration. In 1997, the Endowment for Exhibitions and Acquisition of Art was established as well as our library fund. Then three years later, the Wooden Lecture Series was created to fund lectures at the Wichita Art Museum with the caveat that all lectures would be free forever and open to the public. All of the Friends Endowments are now managed by the Wichita Community Foundation. Over the years, the funds have grown from $293,000 to near $4 million. We give the museum approximately a half a million dollars each year for art exhibitions, acquisitions, materials for the library, and to make these wonderful educational lectures available to the public for free. Now, our very own Dr. Patricia McDonald, the distinguished and very wildly creative director <laughs> of our Wichita Art Museum, who literally has our museum hopping and buzzing and jumping with programs and events that appeal to all. She will do the honors in presenting our speaker for this evening. Thank you. Patricia. Heavens, thank you, Kelly. Um, also really happy to have such a great crowd um, at the Art Museum this evening for a time of year that is just, it's always hectic. It, 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 we're in the thick of it and it's really busy. Here at the Wichita Art Museum, many of you may be aware that it's even wilder than most balls because we are in this interesting journey of around the wham in 80 days. So from September 22nd until our wonderful uh, party, uh, bang up party to end of the year on December 12th, we're doing something every single day. We are, we're celebrating on the staff because we're over the hump. Um, <laughs> We're, we're beyond uh, the halfway mark, and actually we have exactly, from today, exactly a, a month um, going of other programs and activities and all sorts of different things in, until September 12th. So, um, also to acknowledge that the Friends are this terrific lifeblood of the Wichita Art Museum. I've really come to gain the sense that you know, we lowly art museum directors, we come, we go, but the friends remain and are just stalwart. And so many people who are part of this organization, this really has been their home away from home for decades. Um, they help us with countless activities and events, um, such as the, the Wooden Lecture Series. Um, and, and you just heard they have an endowment fund both to support exhibitions and as well art purchases. So with our glorious new art garden, it's the Friends of the Wichita Art Museum that wholly supported the two new acquisitions of the commissions of Derek Porter's uh, Pulse Field and Vicki Scurry's Windscreen. So um, I deeply appreciate the importance of the Friends of the Wichita Art Museum to this organization. They, I really love that they devoted this named endowed um, lecture series to a beloved former director of the museum. Howard Wooden was here from 70, 1975 to 1989. He was responsible, during that time, he was responsible for the building expansion of the Edward Larrabee Barnes um, 
architecture um, added great depth and quality to the art um, to the art collection itself and clearly was just um, a charming loved person in this community that ultimately the friends wanted to both endow and um, name this lecture series after him this year um, we've had two wooden lectures um, this year um, this evening being the second and both of them have been devoted to the artist edward hopper i see any number of faces in the room this evening who were here in april um, when we heard from the photographer gail albert haliban oh what a fascinating artist and how she has sort of mined the footsteps and the traces and really inhabited i think the mind space of Edward Hopper in Gloucester. Um, and, and yet, you know, uh, uh, given the number of people who were here tonight, we even had to add more uh, chairs at the back of the room. Who doesn't love Edward Hopper? <laughs> Whether he's depicting a conversation in an office, uh, a movie theater scenario, someone who's lingering on a city apartment stoop, um, looking at a lighthouse or even just an everyday street scene, there's something that's very deep and poignant and just he, he captures something very special. Um, often his imagery for me has this quality where it's both lyrical but there's also something something just unnerving something that's on that's haunting about it at the same time so the hopper scholar Rob Silber Silberman um, ha has stated quote hoppers paintings offer scenes without scenarios introducing narratives full of suggesting but lacking explanations tonight's speaker wrote and I quote Hopper's women represent the very idea of emotional detachment and can evoke thoughts of what that portends for society and humanity. We're very lucky to have uh, Patty Junker as our wooden lecture speaker this evening. Um, she is going to share some really interesting new scholarship um, that she's developed on the women in Hopper's uh, paintings. This was uh, both an exhibition and a book for her a number of years ago. Um, interestingly, this being Patty, um, as I extended the invitation to her, I, I assumed, you know, Patty, you've already got that lecture in the drawer. We don't know about it. Please come and just, you know, uh, give that lecture. No, 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 no. Patty had to do new research. We're about to learn things about our very own painting, Conference at Night. So she's building on uh, a project and research that she had done a couple of years ago with um, uh, deeper research um, with relevance to the Wichita Art Museum. So she is the Ann Barwick Curator of American Art at Seattle Art Museum. And she has um, held that position since 2004. Formerly, she was at such museums as the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art and the Fine Arts Museums in San Francisco. She's an important scholar in American art history with publications um, with um, the likes of the National Gallery of Art, the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco, Yale University Press, Thames and Hudson, some pretty fancy, prestigious places, and the list could go on. Her scholarship, she's done scholarship in particular depth, depth you know, really written about um, 19th century, 20th century, uh, very interesting subjects, but really has gone um, in deep in the artist Winslow Homer and Irving Norman. And um, probably 15 years or so ago, she did what is the definitive retrospective and catalog on John Stuart Curry. So we as Kansans uh, very much care about that. She's now looking at Edward Hopper. Um, and another project that she's working on, uh, we were drawing her out and talking about it today, she's, she's looking at how Georgia O'Keeffe really came under the spell of James McNeil Whistler. I can't wait. I gotta wait a couple of years for her to <clears throat> write that book. At any rate, um, please help me to welcome to the stage Patty Junker. Thank you all for that. Uh, thank you, Patricia, for that introduction. Thank you for turning out. Thank you for the Wichita hospitality. This has really been just a remarkable couple of days. I have always wanted to come to this museum, and I never 
thought that I might have the opportunity, um, particularly on such an occasion as this where I actually get invited to speak. Um, you so generously lent Curry paintings to my exhibition some years ago, and I was thrilled to see them in the context of this collection because this is such an important um, snapshot of a time in American art and to have it represented here in such concentration and such quality has really been an education for me. So um, it, it has been an, a learning experience from the moment I was invited um, to speak here tonight um, and I was glad to learn about um, one of your Hopper paintings that will be the focus of my talk. If we can bring the lights down, we'll start with the images. It's interesting how it evolved. Um, there are two paintings that I'll focus on tonight, and as it turned out that they were both conversation pieces, of course, of, of sorts, um, even though we can't hear the conversations that are taking place in either of the paintings that I'm going to talk about, the, the conversations nevertheless tell us quite a bit about about women in their place in time, and they reveal a lot, I think, about Hopper's imagination. Well, actually, they reveal a, a little bit because it's so um, extraordinary and, and big, his imagination, and so open to interpretation. So that's, um, I'm going to venture um, into that, interpreting this man's vast imagination. Um, in 1950, painter Charles Birchfield wrote in praise of Edward Hopper, he said, posterity will be able to learn more about our life of today through looking at Hopper's work than from all the social schools, political comments, or screaming headlines of the present. This seems to me to be an odd comment, perhaps because Though Hopper painted through two world wars and the Great Depression, he had no interest in polemics about brutality and breadlines. And instead, he painted things like old houses, this um, work which was the first acquisition for the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art, um, these typically lonely Victorian structures that were out of place and out of time in modern America. And he painted women women in restaurants, rooming houses, movie theaters, train cars, and eventually offices. He focused on women endlessly, obsessively even. In discussions of his art, we tend to speak of hopper light and of close, confined hopper space and of the emotional detachment in hopper's deadpan pictorial style. But surely, characters, setting, and a palpable sense of drama are additional qualities, the ones that many of us find especially appealing in Hopper's art. John Updike, in an interview about Hopper that he gave in Seattle in November 2008, just before his death, said that when he looks at Hopper's paintings, he smells his mother's face powder and feels the velvet upholstery of his family's old furniture and hears the radio. So clearly are the paintings evocative of a distinct time and place and of individuals. Yet sensations like these are rarely remarked upon outside of Updike's revealing essays on Hopper. It's almost as if to do so would be to diminish Hopper's art as anecdotal and would somehow make him less modern than the artist who could reduce an interior to pure design and pattern, color design and pattern. And though much has been made of the notion that Hopper was an abstract artist at heart who tried for decades to break free of the grip of character and place, which he seemed to ultimately achieve with this painting, Sun in an Empty Room of 1963, this is actually an anomaly, and Hopper himself eloquently denied that abstractions were for him anything but failures of the imagination. He said, no amount of skillful invention can replace the essential element of imagination. 
He wrote this in a kind of manifesto that he, that he penned in 1953 for a short-lived magazine called Reality, which he co-founded. The inner life of a human being is a vast and varied realm and does not concern itself alone with stimulating arrangements of color, form, and design, he continued. The province of art is to react to life and not to shun it. Painting will have to deal more fully and less obliquely with life and nature's phenomena before it can again become great. Um, this is Hopper's eloquent, um, as I said, manifesto. In Hopper's reactions to life and his expressions of the complex human psyche, women loom large. Tonight I'll talk about two of Hopper's women, women painted a quarter century apart and who occupy two very different positions in a man's world. We'll start with the first one, the redhead in the dining room at lunchtime, um, New York restaurant of 1922. Now these chapter headings of mine will sound like um, those, those, the clue, if any of you have ever played clue in that, you know, the, <laughs> you choose the weapon, the character, and the setting. Um, I realized after I wrote them, it must have come from my uh, childhood days of playing clue. So we're, we have the mystery of the redhead in the dining room at lunchtime um, in a painting that I'm going to talk about next. But let's look at Edward Hopper in um, early, 1903-1906, in his self-portrait. Timid as an English schoolboy is how painter Guy Pendebois described Hopper in 1918. Too much Anglo-Saxon reserve. This shy man managed to satisfy some of his need for social connection and artistic inspiration simply by observing others from a, com a comfortable distance. And he could do this surreptitiously in movie theaters or on the elevated train, which passed close by the unshaded windows of Manhattan tenements. But more often, especially in his years as a fledgling painter, and later during periods of inactivity, and there were many, as Hopper waited for his muse to visit him, he haunted restaurants like the, the Automat, he said, watching, eavesdropping, and feeding his imagination, thinking about the men, and especially the women, assembled in these places and the circumstances that brought them there, all of them participating in what was essentially a communal activity, dining all together in the same place, and yet each participant or couple, strangely alone, as this young woman is in the automat. Edward Hopper came to find some of his favorite subjects in restaurants because he was an inveterate cafe sitter and had been since his early years as an artist in Paris. And you see him in Paris in 1907, probably sitting in a, in a cafe. The cafes of Bohemian Montmartre had been something of an artist's studio for him. I used to go to the cafes in, at night and sit and watch, Hopper said of his formative experiences in Paris. There this shy man could study and draw any number of willing models ready to strike a pose or adopt a persona like the woman on the right. Hopper could simply sit in the cafes, because everyone did, and he could watch the parade of colorful characters who traversed this impromptu public stage. Cafes were convenient places for Hopper to hone his skills as an observer and recorder of character types. But in their social dynamic, cafes offered something more. Hopper's Paris sketches show us his encounters with the audacious Europeans of the cafe crowd. Dandies, rogues, rakes, dancers, actresses, shop girls, and harlots. As casual meeting places for socially and sexually uninhibited men and women, Paris cafes presented a continuously unfolding and highly charged, if ambiguous, human drama. The shy, young, Baptist-reared hopper may have been content to watch from the periphery, 
but his studies show he became thoroughly absorbed in this strange, decadent theater of the street. The objects of his curiosity, as the drawings and watercolors attest, were often the fetching women of the street and of the demimonde who stared at him. If he was self-conscious at first, he somehow overcame his reserve. As these women of the cafes stared seductively at him, Hopper came to learn and enjoy the fine art of staring back. <laughs> now, in New York, um, where this drawing would have been made, um, this is a drawing for um, an illustration because Hopper was, you know, in the first years of his career, an illustrator and a watercolorist before he was a painter of um, urban angst and women. Um, in New York, the unpretentious restaurants around Hopper's Washington Square flat and studio in Greenwich Village, these further served Hopper's proclivities for staring and eavesdropping. And many of New York's public eateries had become, in the years after the Great War, they had become nearly as socially diverse and interesting as the colorful Paris cafes, as the chop suey restaurant here um, in 1929, as interesting as the cafes that Homer had relished visiting, uh, that Hopper had relished visiting in Paris. Therefore, given the, the, his fascination with these restaurants, the wonder is not that a scene of women in a restaurant should suddenly come from Hopper's imagination in 1922 with this painting, as he considered modern life. The wonder is that such a picture, this picture, New York restaurant of 1922, the wonder is that it did not come sooner. This painting, I don't know if any of you have seen it, it's in the Muskegon Museum and it's a small painting, a modestly scaled painting, so easily overlooked and yet of monumental importance in setting the direction for Hopper's art. In a 1937 letter to the New York art dealer Maynard Walker, a Kansan, I've learned, Hopper explained in his inimitable, terse and cryptic way, he said, the essence of his New York restaurant um, was he made two points. The first was this, in a specific and concrete sense, he wrote, the idea was to attempt to make visual the crowded glamour of a New York restaurant during the noon hour. Hopper's restaurant does seem authentic in that way, giving us the look and feel of a familiar kind of Manhattan eatery. Though Hopper has narrowed our view of the dining room in a tightly cropped composition, and he directs our attention toward a very few players, we can still easily imagine the crowded space beyond our frame of vision, a large room bustling with the comings and goings on the periphery, a room filled with the noise of dishes rattling and crackling with the sounds of hearty exchanges and lively conversation. The various details suggest that it is a nice uptown place, the kind of restaurant where businessmen regularly lunch. It is respectable, but not pretentious, with white linen tablecloths and sprightly well-groomed waitresses who wear pretty starched uniforms. A pleasant seeming young woman has a position at what must be the cashier's stand near the door. Do you see her? The men in the picture seem to fit easily and unselfconsciously into this setting. One man at upper left appears to be preparing to leave and must be paying his check at the cashier's stand. You can see him almost kind of reaching into his pocket. Another man at center is wholly unmoved by all the activity around him and is focused on his lunch and whatever it is that the lady dining with him must be saying. The presence of women in the picture barely registers with us today. A restaurant without women diners would appear strange to us for sure. But here's where context proves helpful in trying to understand Hopper's imagination in 1922. The historical facts tell us that in the 1920s, the women in this dining room would have stood out to Hopper and to the picture's viewers. 
Female servers for certain would have stood out, for they were relatively new fixtures appearing in certain kinds of restaurants. Enterprising restaurateurs increasingly employed young women servers to entice and amuse male diners with suggestive teasing, a fact that underscores the degree to which restaurants catered to the private obsessions of their chief clientele, men, as well as to their dining needs. Hopper has included here a shapely, presumably young waitress. We see only her back. She's not an individual, really, but a type. She bends to clear the table, and the way she's been painted, a viewer cannot help but notice her curves. The big bow of her apron draws just that more attention to her cinched waist and uh, an hourglass form. Hopper's positioned the viewer among the diners, and he forces us to stare at this waitress who's unaware of being watched. So our staring seems more than a bit invasive, it seems to me. So paintings about restaurants in the 1920s and 1930s are inevitably paintings about women because the presence or absence of women in dining rooms represented something essential about Hopper's time and place as long-standing Victorian-era Yankee values collided with the needs of a new kind of American woman on her own at home in the modern city. Women were new and ubiquitous figures on the restaurant scene. They obviously added color and glamour to once formal and dour dining rooms, as Hopper's New York restaurant clearly shows us. But their presence in restaurants also represented to the thoroughly Victorian Hopper and to his viewing audience dramatic social change and conjured among many, surely, unspeakable sexual tensions. In his letter to Maynard Walker about this painting, Hopper made a further statement about his musings on the crowded glamour of a New York restaurant during the noon hour. He said, I'm hoping that ideas less easy to define have perhaps crept in also, he said. Hopper thus placed a, placed a premium on something subtle. There's more here than meets the eye, he was saying. Which brings me to the third vignette in the painting, the couple at the center of the picture. They sit in the viewer's direct line of sight, yet we feel that this couple, so utterly inactive, so deeply engaged in one another, and so seemingly unresponsive to the activity around them, they might not even arouse our attention were it not for the color notes that the woman provides at the center of the composition her red hair, and striking crimson cloche. We stare at the back of this red-haired woman. We don't see her face, but she nevertheless engages us immensely. What makes her all the more interesting, I think, is the inscrutable face of her dining companion. We glimpse his face, but because he glances down at his plate, we cannot see his full expression. He seems not to be speaking. Is his the deadpan look of indifference to his table companion? Or is it the sign of complete absorption in listening? Our fascination with the couple grows, I think, precisely because they elude our close and concentrated scrutiny. The two reveal little about themselves and nothing of whatever intimacy they share. There's no defining action in this picture. As we look at this vignette, we puzzle over the picture's context. Who are these anonymous people? What sequence of events has brought them together and what will develop from their interaction? As a magazine illustrator, Hopper was adept at creating graphic images with clear, succinct storylines. But in New York restaurant, he avoided melodrama or anecdotes he avoided the suggestion of any obvious caption. The picture is oddly fragmentary and ambiguous. It's even hard to read the composition itself because there are ill-defined spatial planes that are pressed flat against the surface, creating an effect that forces the viewer to register a multitude of visual data without the benefit of direction from perspective or light and shadow. The painting is suggestive rather than narrative. Its interest psychological rather than sentimental. 
Hopper ratcheted up the intrigue level of his anonymous pair of diners at center when he gave his female subject red hair. It's a small thing of huge consequence, I think. The woman's red hair, visible beneath her bright red hat, stands out and draws us to the otherwise unremarkable pairing of a man and woman at lunch. Hopper has defined this woman in large part by her red hair. And when you give a woman red hair, so many associations follow. As writer Marion Roach put it in her wonderful book, which I highly recommend, entitled Roots of Desire, The Myth, Meaning, and Sexual Power of Red Hair, red hair on a female character packs an iconographic wallop. Think Belle Watley and Gone with the Wind, she said, or Miss Kitty in Gunsmoke. You see Miss Kitty on the right and Belle Watley on the left, as though we needed um, these pictures, we, they're all so um, in our memory. It seems that whenever a red-haired woman is involved, a story takes on an added air of mystery based on the presumed character traits of the woman involved. I scanned the New York Times for 1922 to see what newsworthy accounts of red-haired women I might find. <laughs> Stories that Hopper might have read, stories that might have triggered something in the artist's imagination to bring forth this painting. And I was not disappointed in my searches. <laughs> and I'll share some of those. For I found several sensational news stories involving redheads. Stories in which the distinctive hair color of the female protagonist or antagonist was specifically called out in the newspaper, imagine. There was the mystery in September 1922 of a good-looking, red-haired woman, it was reported, who deposited two suitcases, a traveling bag, and a large cardboard box. She left these with a boot black on West 53rd Street and then disappeared in a taxi, leaving behind what turned out to be an entire wardrobe and a collection of love letters. There's a hopper painting for you. <laughs> There was the intrigue-filled tale of divorce in October 1922 involving a prominent Manhattan socialite, a red-haired woman in scanty attire, the New York Times said, seen in the bedroom of a man who was not her husband. And her presence in that bedroom on that occasion was attested to by no fewer than 55 different eyewitnesses, by the way. <laughs> This story conjures up, of course, a kind of hopper genre of women glimpsed in bedrooms. Another Manhattan redhead who made news in February 1922 is tantalizingly close, it seems to me, to what could be the circumstance of the redhead in Hopper's painting. In this case, a red-haired woman brought charges against a man she had met in a Greenwich Village restaurant a man who had lured this upright married woman to his apartment by the offer of discount hats and shoes for sale. I mean, why not? When his true intentions she discovered, and only after it was too late, she said, his true intentions were entirely nefarious. Now probably every one of us could create a story about the anonymous central female character in Hopper's New York restaurant by virtue of our reaction to that one essential attribute, her red hair. Is this then the element of suggestiveness that Hopper said he hoped he had infused into the picture? Who is Hopper's red-haired woman? Is she a free spirit? Is she a temptress? Is she a harlot, or is she a naive, too easily pegged with the social stigmas that red-haired women have garnered through history? Is Hopper's redhead akin to the redheads he knew in his friend's paintings? Is she the prostitute of John Sloan's Chinese restaurant? Or the professional beauty and trophy wife of the man about town, a type made famous in William Glacken's painting, Shay Lu Can? Or is she the stunning model, Kay Laurel, painted by Glackens, a woman who went on to be a Ziegfeld dancer and a famous femme fatale. We can build a story around what the picture of a mysterious redhead might suggest about a place in time, Manhattan, in 1922. 
But as this 1939 movie poster reminds us, when we talk about women in art, the real story is about the men who painted them. So what might the couple in New York restaurant, the man and his red-haired companion, what might they reveal about Hopper himself? This painting shows, this painting of the New York restaurant that we've been looking at, shows that Hopper's imagination had reached a new stage in 1922. He had long hoped to build a reputation on his plein air Paris city views, if you can believe it, um, and he did this without success. But now, with New York restaurant and three paintings that are its immediate precursors, like Girl at a Sewing Machine, and New York interior and Moonlight interior, all of these done about the same time. Now he had suddenly turned inward, examining private spaces where his internal musings could play out. New York restaurant is key in establishing the direction that Hopper's art would take. Surely it opened Hopper up to the expressive potential of suggestive psychological studies of men and women that are Hopper's Nighthawks of 1942 and Wichita's Conference of, at Night of 1949 and so many other paintings. Hopper's own intimacies in 1922 were hard to gauge. Middle-aged and unmarried, Hopper seemed to his painter friend, Guy Pendebois, he seemed to exert a hunger that might be ascribed to a yearning for closeness. Should be married, Pendubois wrote of Hopper in his diary in 1918, but can't imagine to what kind of woman, the hunger of that man. Beginning around 1918, Hopper had in fact become close with a French woman who was the subject of a succession of sketches and prints, some of them quite intimate, like this one of Madame Cherie, asleep. Hopper may not have disclosed this friendship to anyone, and the true tenor of the relationship is not known. But there's some evidence that Hopper cherished his time with this woman. To the end of his life, he kept his sketches of her, together with her gift to him of a volume of poetry by the French symbolist Paul Verlaine, which she, prevented to, she presented to Hopper at Christmas 1922, inscribing it, Souvenir d'amitié, memory of a friendship. As model in Muse in the years between 1918 and 1922, Hopper's French friend might have been the inspiration for an evolving series of prints in which the artist focused with increasing intensity on solitary women glimpsed in intimate settings. The series included East Side Interior and the erotic Evening Wind of 1921. These well-known prints appear in Hopper's work alongside a few lesser known, but similarly voyeuristic pictures, like the, the three that I just showed you. Girl at a Sewing Machine of around 1921, New York Interior, also of around 1921, and the Nocturne Moonlight Interior of 1921 to 23. In all of these paintings, the objects of the surreptitious onlooker's gaze is a fleshy, auburn-haired woman. Might the naked woman of Moonlight Interior be the red-haired woman of Hopper's New York restaurant? If so, the woman of Hopper's extended fantasy has moved out of the shadows to a table now in a proper uptown dining room where she sits unabashedly with a gentleman companion in the brilliant light of noontime. Was Hopper in this puzzling little canvas giving form to his own fantasy, wherein he might no longer be the man who sits alone in the lunchroom and stares. Is this a long-imagined moment when Hopper no longer conceals his passion, but sits unselfconsciously in broad daylight with the seductive object of his desire, the two of them sharing an intimacy that no one else could know? Well, moving on to our next mystery. I have no answers for those questions, but I leave you with them. Now we will move to the blonde in the cutting room with the lights out, Edward Hopper's conference at night. In the summer of 1923, after he had unveiled um, New York Restaurant, just months after he had unveiled it, 
When he was 41 years old, Hopper renewed an acquaintance with another red-haired woman he had known as a fellow art student a decade earlier. He had known her a decade earlier as a fellow art student in the studio of Robert Henry. She was Josephine Nivison. You see her in Henry's portrait of her, the young woman in that portrait of 1906, a woman who was Hopper's exact contemporary. She was only eight months younger than Hopper and had herself remained unmarried. He reconnected with her by chance that summer of 1923 in Gloucester, and the two enjoyed painting there together, and this is Hopper's watercolor of Joe sketching on the beach. The following summer, 1924, they married. He was 42, she was 41. From that point on, Joe became the woman in all of Hopper's paintings which henceforth increasingly focused on the subject of modern women. Jo was his model, and so she assumed the many different female roles he assigned to her in the studio, and thus accommodated herself to his unspoken fantasies as well, many of them, like this one, involving much younger women than she, and most with unmistakable erotic overtones. After their marriage, Joe eagerly became the keeper of the Hopper painting registry too, carefully documenting titles, dates, and sales. Occasionally, she made ed editorial comments in the notebooks, which at times can offer insights into otherwise inscrutable pictures. Joe did that in, in her entry for the painting that ultimately came to the Wichita Art Museum, Your Enigmatic Conference at Night. Joe's entry describes the painting this way. She tells us it is set in a loft building and that the room is illuminated by the lights from outside. So think about it, and I'm sure you have. These three people are meeting in a room with the lights out. Joe decided that the gesturing man at right, she'd named Sammy, and although we know she modeled for the arms and hands of the woman, Joe decided that the statuesque queenly blonde, she described her, um, this blonde that Hopper created from his imagination, she decided that she would be called Deborah. Joe misread one of the very few props as a ledger book. She described this as a ledger book. Um, when in fact, it is two of the three bolts of cloth that lie conspicuously in an otherwise empty room. It's hard to believe that she and Edward actually talked much about the painting because she wrote with some puzzlement about it to her sister-in-law in her New Year's greeting on January 1, 1949. She wrote, Ed's busy painting a canvas of a scene in a loft building at night and three garment workers cooking up something in Ed's particular light effect. Why celebrate the clothing workers conference? Something he might have seen from an elevated at night, she guessed. The fact that Joe could identify the figures at gar as garment workers, given so few clues, is not just due slowly to the props, the, the bolts of cloth, but it's also because of the particular architectural space they occupy, a distinctive loft space, like the, the spaces that are in buildings like this. Lofts, large open spaces made possible by steel frame construction and elevators, were designed specifically for the garment industry as all aspects of clothing production came to be incorporated under one roof. And because New York City ordinances demanded proper light and ventilation for clothing workers. Midtown Manhattan's west side between 6th, 6th and 9th Avenues from 35th to 41st Street, the city's garment district, remains architecturally unique with the high-rise loft buildings that were designed beginning in the 1920s to accommodate the display and mass production of women's ready-to-wear. The trio was cooking up something Joe could tell. Anyone who followed the wild and woolly rag trade would naturally assume that three of its members conferring in the dark were up to something unspeakable. The garment industry was its own particular mix of sinister shenanigans. There was big money in women's ready-to-wear and political power in its enormous labor force. The money and power groups were constantly jockeying for more of both. 
price fixing, labor busting, unionizing, communist party organizing, all of these things were done and done in secret in empty out of the way spaces like this one, the cleared out cutting room off one end of the assembly floor. And always such business was done under cover of night. The ladies' garment trade was too. Look, you can see these are all characters right out of Edward Hopper's painting. The ladies' garment trade was too its own toxic mix of powerful money men and the self possessed women who were, after all, the public image of the ladies' garment industry. Add to this the legions of virtually powerless women, too, many of them new immigrants who worked as sewers and as secretaries, stenographers, and switchboard operators, and had no choice but to bend to the will of their male bosses. The garment industry was no place for the faint of heart or the incorruptible. In June of 1952, when Hopper replied to an inquiry by Josephine Stubblefield, novice, into the meaning of the painting, and it's interesting, curators are always writing to ask for the meaning of Hopper's, to ask about the meaning of these of Hopper's paintings. This was the newest acquisition for the Wichita Art Museum's Roland P. Murdoch collection. Well, Hopper said little about it. He said, it is going to be difficult for me to make words do much for conference at night, he began. Actually, Hopper might have made an effort to offer Mrs. Navas something more, if for no other reason than to assuage any unease that she or others might have had regarding the subject of the picture. For already the painting's first buyer, Stephen Clark, who was a huge Hopper fan, he had returned this painting to the Wren Gallery, explaining that his wife thought this conference at night looked too much like a communist gathering. <laughs> Clearly, Mrs. Clark had been reading the newspaper headlines announcing the Communist Party's declared intention of systematically recruiting among the country's industrial workers as a way to put their candidates, pro-organized labor candidates, in government. And there was no industry in New York bigger than the ladies' garment industry. A U.S. Commerce Department report in 1949 showed that New York's garment makers produced three of every four dresses worn by American women, and that New York City had the largest number of skilled dress workers in the country. The idea of a loft or business building with the artificial light of the street coming into the room at night had been in my mind for some years before I attempted it, Hopper told Mrs. Novice, and had been suggested by things I had seen on Broadway in walking there at night. He would have been referring to scenes like these at Times Square, where the signs of clothiers and other of the needle trades are scattered among the theater and club marquees. It had been in my mind for some years before I attempted it, Hopper explained. I wonder if he might have meant that it had been on his mind since he painted his first, his first version of a similar office scene at night a scene of late night business in what appears to be another Manhattan garment industry loft building. And you know, here's that screen and those posts. It's sort of almost like this is the room on the other side of the cutting room. Um, and I'd love to see the two pictures together. There's such a similar kind of architecture. Office at night, at that point, Hopper's only other office picture, interesting, it was painted a decade earlier than Conference at Night. It was painted in 1940. This painting was still on Hopper's mind in the summer of 1948, however, when it was finally purchased by the Walker Arts Center. Again, as all the curators were wont to do, Norman Geske of the Walker Arts Center wrote to Hopper at that time, in 1948, asking for an explanation of the painting, which had been acquired for the museum with only two votes of the three-member <laughs> art purchasing panel. So it was a little bit controversial. Hopper was unforthcoming to Geske as usual, perhaps feeling that the psychic and sexual tensions were palpable enough that anyone could bring their own story, could build their own story around the picture. But perhaps Geske's questions planted a new seed in Hopper's mind for another noirish picture set in the notorious garment district. This one. The result was obtained by improvisation and from no known factor seen. 
This is what Hopper said in conclusion in his letter to Mrs. Novice in Wichita about conference at night. The result was obtained by improvisation and from no known fact or scene. And yet he must have had an exceptionally clear image in his mind's eye when he started to work on the canvas, for he painted the picture in an astonishingly, an astonishingly short period of time in just over two weeks from start to finish between January 1st and the 16th, 1949. He delivered it to his dealer, Frank Wren, on January 18th. So how might we account for Hopper's return to noirish musings on an office or workplace at night in 1949? And why such a clear inner vision of a conference taking place in a deserted garment manufactory cutting room in the dark if this were a mere improvisation from no known factor seen, as he said? What might have triggered Hopper's musings on the, on the secret after hours business in a dark, empty garment district cutting room. Just as I had decided to look into newspaper accounts of intrigue involving redheads in Manhattan in 1922 to get some sense of the broader social context for Hopper's mystifying New York restaurant, I went again to the popular press to see if I might find anything about a blonde in the cutting room with male cohorts in the dark. Well, this time I was not rewarded. The New York Times does carry accounts here and there throughout the late 1940s about communist subversives in the garment trade and about strikes and about racketeering. However, it was in a work of fiction where I found the riveting, Hopper-esque kind of story of garment industry <laughs> intrigue fleshed out in all of its dark and even raunchy detail a book that captivated readers for more than a decade after it was published in 1937. That's Jerome Weidman's I Can Get It For You Wholesale. And that's a cover of a later paperback. Um, I couldn't find a cover from 1937, but this is the, a cover that people would have seen in the 1940s. Weidman's subject was unique in popular fiction in 1937. We know this um, from accounts. His raw account of a garment industry racketeer and rake was declared a breakthrough into completely new and fresh literary terrain by none other than F. Scott Fitzgerald. The New York Times likened Weidman's intimate knowledge and unflinching focus on garment industry sleaze as akin to Ernest Hemingway's knowledge of Paris cafes. Hemingway said of its clipped, if crude, dialogue I think Weidman can write just a little better than anybody else that's around. Now, I bought a copy of the edition published in 1959 by the Modern Library to, modern in, to honor and preserve an American literary classic, but you may not easily find the novel in the public library, though you might find the recording of the sanitized Broadway musical version of 1962 in which Barbara Streisand made her Broadway debut as the fetching but naive Miss Marblestein, a woman who in Weidman's novel is the archetype of the curvaceous and compliant secretary, the model perhaps for the kind of shapely secretary we saw in Hopper's office at night, which was painted, remember, just three years after Weidman's novel made its rather shocking appearance. It's hard to see that, you know, Barbara Streisand character there because it was so completely reinterpreted for the stage in the 60s. Um, but it just shows you how this novel resonated from 1937 into the 60s. Weidman's, book, my, Weidman's story of the sexual exploitation of the office girls and the cold-blooded sabotage of the clothier's shipping clerks is told in a series of vignettes, each of which might be illustrated with a Hopper painting, it seems to me. Weidman was already a popular New Yorker and Esquire short story writer when he published I Can Get It For Your Wholesale. The Times characterized Weidman's consistent narrative formula in terms that can be applied to Hopper's art and, be, can, and can be applied aptly to Hopper's conference at night. Weidman wrote, single scene revelations of an emotional situation, is what the New York Times said, 
wherein setting is all important and has at least a superficial interest of its own. And I think that's the case of the empty cutting room. And I wanted to show you the only cutting room picture that I could really find to show you those broad tables being used in the daytime and why they would be cleared away at night. But this is a curious room. It could have been any other kind of room, but interesting. A, a, a setting that has a superficial interest of its own like this, this oddity, this garment cutting room, jam full of large, uncluttered tables. Weidman's pension for the elliptical title, the New York Times said, helped to engage readers, too. A Weidman story was simply an interesting conversation about a happening or state of affairs previously existing. That's how the Times put it. The same could well be said of Haber's paintings, and especially of, of Conference at Night. Now, Weidman had been a garment industry man, so he came to his subject, subject naturally and with an insider's knowledge. He knew what happened in so many conferences at night. Weidman's protagonist, the Lothario Harry Bogan, invents assignments for his secretary to keep her in the office late and to inspire her willing, dutiful accommodation of his needs. I was paying her a salary anyway, wasn't I? Harry Bogan asks rhetorically. And the office rent was the same whether I used it eight hours a day or 24, wasn't it? Um, Bogan's secretaries wield their own sexual power over him also in hopes of getting ahead or getting a husband. So you can imagine the tensions in the, um, in the office. The conniving Harry Bogan and his cohorts conference in places like the cutting room out of earshot of the secretaries and unseen by the shipping clerks whose jobs they are systematically destroying. That is, the plot of the, of the novel is to destroy um, the, the shipping clerks. Now, um, Weidman shows in his book that the most powerful players in the complicated game of producing cheap ladies ready to wear for ever greater profit the most powerful players were the icy women buyers who had complete control over who sold what dress designs to a retailer. You see one here. This is like, you know, I imagine the Queen Lady Deborah there. Um, men, actually it's sort of supplicants before these women, fought each other for a chance to get their samples before these women for even a few seconds at the regular scramble that was the sample selling. Harry Bowden, who hungered after women, uncharacteristically seethes in his description of these coy, self-possessed women. He says, the buyers began to come out, dressed for the street, carrying their order books, swinging their cans, and shaking their heads at the salesmen that hung around them like flies. I imagine, as I said, Haber's Dorothy in Conference at Night as perhaps one of these women, experienced imperious, the men deferential to her. When I Can Get It For You Wholesale was made into a film in 1951, the screenplay converted the protagonist into a conniving woman. I offer this aside because I think the facts suggest something about the popular view of the new woman in American business at this time. She was easily demonized. Hopper's queenly Dorothy in Conference at Night is a type of woman that had been evolving in the workforce over the 20 years since Hopper painted his first women in, in a businessman's world, sitting demurely in a businessman's restaurant. Interestingly, Conference at Night was purchased for the Murdoch collection just a year after the film version of I Can Get It For Your Wholesale was released. And so the subject matter of this particular hopper might not have seemed so obscure to Wichita viewers. The film could have affected their reading at that time of the picture's various characters. The self-possessed woman of the 1940s came to haunt Hopper's imagination, whether she was the sneering seductress of summer evening of 1947, you see here, or the commanding blonde conferring in the dark with her cohorts in a garment house cutting room. Was this particular woman another embodiment of Hopper's own thoughts about this new type of modern American woman? This icy blonde, this don't mess with me blonde, this grand dame? In Hopper's paintings, these women represent um, this emotional attachment that I've said before.
Did he think about what they offered? Did he think about what they portended for society? Did Hopper read Weidman's notorious novel? Did it help to shape the paintings office at night and conference at night? We don't know. If you think back to that movie poster, it said the, the novel of the decade. You can imagine how long there was interest in this, but we don't know if he read it. But how might Hopper have come to understand the fine points of the male-female dynamic in the garment industry without knowing Weidman's unusual, if not unique, and raw expose? How could Hopper have so thoroughly understood the psychic and sexual tensions in this kind of workplace? How could he have understood it on his own? Weidman was not a writer of pulp fiction, but had a literary fight.